practical uses of differential calculus. So in this um, session, what we're going to do is look at some sort of engineering uses of differentiation that we were covering last week. Okay. Typically, we'll look at determining rates of change, successive di differentiation, velocity and acceleration problems, finding turning points, and practical problems involving minimum and maximum values. Whether we get all that done will be another matter, but we'll, the, the, the exam will be written accordingly. Okay? So, along the lines of I ain't going to try and test you on stuff and I haven't taught you. All right? So, we don't get through all of this. We're going to move on to integral calculus this afternoon. All right? So, well, that's my plan anyway. Let's see how we get on. So, rates of change. If a quantity y depends on and varies with another quantity x, then the rate of change of y with respect to x is dy by dx. I.e., if we want to know the rate of change of a function, we differentiate it and find dy by dx or whatever other letters we come across. If we were trying to find the rate of change of pressure P with respect to height H, for instance, the tank, then we'd, that would be dP by dH, how the pressure varies with the height of liquid in the tank. A rate of change with respect to time is usually called just the rate of change. So if that doesn't say with respect to anything, the assumption is that that's time. Okay? So, for example, the rate of change of current is dI by dt. Rate of change of temperature, theta, is d theta by dt. So, if it doesn't say with respect to a different variable, the assumption made is that that's with respect to time. Right? And that's where most of your rates of change are going to be with respect to, in all honesty, with time. So, let's have a look at a problem. We've got a length. Uh, the length in metres, uh, the length L in metres of a certain metal rod at temperature theta degrees C is given by L is equal to, let's write this out a bit bigger, L is equal to 1 plus 0.4 noughts 5 theta plus 0. Point, how many notes? 6 notes. <coughs> 6 notes. 4 theta squared. Mental note, all start completely on the left of the board. So that's the formula we've got. Guys, and it says, determine the rate of change of length in millimetres per degree C. And the temperature is A, 100 degrees C, and B, 400 degrees C. So what we've got to do is differentiate that first. Find the rate of change of length with temperature. So we're looking to find... Wrong way around. Rate of change of length with temperature. So, looking back into last week, when we differentiate a constant, what happens? Disappears. Yeah, well done. When we differentiate that long number, that long decimal by with theta on the end, what do we end up with? What's the power on that theta there? One. So, it just becomes that constant. Naught point four zeros, five, plus. What about when we differentiate a squared term? Yeah, we have to multiply by the old constant. So we have to do 0 0.6 zeros and multiply the four by two to make it eight, and then take one off the index. 
just think you're on a cell. Yeah, everybody follow that? And numbers are, are strange, very small numbers. But other than that, it's the same process as you were using last week. Okay, so we've now got our um, differential equation, or we've got our equation for the rate of change of length to temperature. And so we can do the two parts of the question. I, when T is equal to 100 degrees C, DL by D theta is equal to 0 0.405 plus 0 0.608 times um, 100. We get an answer. No, no. Uh, what you've got is that long or that very small number times theta to the power one. Yeah. So the process is to multiply by the old power. So one times that number is is that number, isn't it? Right. Yeah. And then take one off the index, giving us theta to the power of zero, which we know anything to the power of zero is one. So the theta just disappears. Yeah. In this one, we we went down here and multiplied by two to make that six zeros and eight. Yeah. And took one off the index theta to the power one. Okay. But it's good that you asked if you didn't see where it comes from. Answer to that. No, not the trailing zeros, you don't know. Yeah. 1.3 times 10 to the minus 4. And that's meters, sorry, that is. Meters per degree C. How can we convert that to millimeters? By a thousand. One point uh, 0.13 millimeters, that is. All right. What? This, this number is like this, 0 point, you've got to move the decimal point, 1, 2, 3, 4 places. All right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then multiplying by a thousand, 0 0.13. All right, yeah. And then B when temperature equals 400 degrees C we've got to do all that but with 400 instead of 100 so DL by D theta 4 noughts 5 of 6 noughts 8 times 400 equals three point seven times ten to the minus four meters per degree C not per feet per degree C which is 
0.37 millimetres per degree C. Yep. Okay. T Fry. Okay, K is the spring constant, would be the spring constant. So that. function of T. So what really so what product rule. So we've got multi we've got two multiplied. So we need to use the my board and say yeah so then what we got
So that's what we got to do. I in this case is minus K. This bit. It's what's in front of T. What final answer? What, what answer you got? Come on in, Nathan. How do we do it? <laughs> minus K, A, D, to the minus K, T. Yeah. The, the only adjustment I would make is I'd write A first, because you normally put them in alphabetical order. Yeah? is 2 pi f cos 2 pi f yeah and then we want our product rule formula so now we can say ds by dt is equal to to follow the product rule formula, we want u, so that's a b to the minus kt times dv by dt 2 pi f cos 2 pi f t times V sine. Well, we've got to plus that now, haven't we? I'll go on a new line. Plus V, which is sine 2 pi F T times du by dt, which is minus a k e to the minus kt. Yep. And then what we've got to do is plug in the values that we've been given in the right places. t is 1, a is 2, k is 0 0.9, and f is 5. So we can now say ds by dt is equal to a, which is 2, e to the minus 0 0.9 times 1. We're going to multiply that by 2 pi times 5 for f, cos. 2 pi times 5 times 1. Add sine 2 pi times 5 times 1. All multiplied by minus 2 times 0.9 e to the minus 0.9 times 1. So you put the numbers in, all right? Some of that could be simplified quite quickly and possibly as you write it out, really, but as 2e to the minus 0 0.9 times 10 pi cos of 10 pi. Plus 
sine of 10 pi minus times minus 1.8 e to the minus 0.9. A little bit easier to read. Yeah. And if you evaluate all of that, you should get 25.55 centimetres per second. So the displacement you were given was measured in centimetres against time, so it must be centimetres per second. It's an engineering question, but it's an application of a function where you would need to use the product rule. All right? I'm reasonably happy with that. Yeah. Gonna have to work on it in the time between sessions and over Easter. Yeah. Any questions that you haven't had a look at? Over Easter, something that you can have a go at, all right? If you get stuck with a mic, we'll cover that in revision. Yeah? So that's a good point for we we'll try to cover as much of it as possible. So, moving on. Successive differentiation. When a function y equals f, x is differentiated with respect to x. We've already seen that we get dy by dx or f dash x. That's called the first differential. If we then, again, so we take that differential and do another differentiation on it, and as d squared y of a dx squared, as pronounced, d2y by dx squared. Or we can write f double dash x. Okay? So, some of the techniques we look at in advanced math, you do six differentiations on a function, you can keep differentiating it for a long time. When you're doing that, notation is quite good because triple dash, and you use like Roman numeral iv for 4 and v for 5 and so on. In, on this module, we won't go any further than the second differential. Okay? So, going in these little notes here. So, if we, if we, so if we take function one, x to the power four, we different. One off the index, we end up with 12x cubed. If we then fix squared, the third differential, 2 times x, 72 differential, we'd end up with. If you count on, some functions, but some functions count on. Always the this will get to the row eventually. Okay? So if f of x F double dash of 
function with respect to x. How do we do that? Take one off the index. Next one. Minus four. Minus twelve. X two. dash differential with respect to x is no goes yep okay so, second differential for the power for the task. So, find the second differential one. Who fancies that? No. Right. <laughs> Product rule for them to add it together. If you run out of space, you need to tear the paper landscape and get a piece of A3. I think. Not going to ask you to do. Right, <laughs> mainly because you wouldn't have. I wouldn't. You wouldn't have enough time to do a question like that in the exam anyway. So that's successive differentiation. One of the key things around engineering and differentiation is that about displacement and velocity and acceleration, both that and um, integration, really. When we, when a car moves a diff distance x meters in a time t seconds along a straight road, the velocity v is constant, then v is, e, is, is x over t meters per second. Yeah. So the velocity is the rate of change of position with time, effectively. The change in x over the change in t. Right? It's normal to use S as displacement. I don't know why it shows X here, or Bird shows X, I think. Alright? But if we, if in this particular case, we've got a, a, a velocity constant, so a constant 10 to the second or 30 miles. If we then, when velocity isn't will not be right, the velocity. So if a line up B is the tangent
tangent to that. for this here, this one in green, we have a function for that, we can differentiate it to find um, dx by dt, yeah, and then plus points. plus equal to dx by dt for the function. Okay? Acceleration. The acceleration A of a car is defined as the rate of change of velocity. And so the slope of a velocity time graph, as shown below, must represent acceleration. So, D has increased in time. A function for that velocity, and we pick a point, a slope that tangent, the acceleration. You can find that by differentiating the formula for velocity. Bearing in mind that the formula for velocity was the first differential of distance against time, so acceleration must be the second differential of distance against time. And I've summarized that on the, on the following slide. Acceleration dv by dt. The acceleration we can find if we differentiate velocity against time. However, velocity is equal to dx by dt, displacement at the time. So, is dx by x squared, the second threshold of distance. Summarizing, it moves a distance x meters at a time t seconds, then distance is equal to the function respect to t, velocity, potential of that respect to time, the time graph, thirdly, the x a, the first velocity is time graph, or the second differential of the displacement graph. Of information, let's have an example. The angular displacement theta radian flywheel varies with time t and follows the equation theta, the angle in radians, moved is equal to 9 t squared minus 2 t cubed. So that's displacement against time, the cubic equation. Okay. Determine A. Fly T is equal to 1 second. Time when right. in, in engineering, in science, I, at a 
omega. Okay? The theta dt, the first difference. So we can that will give us the angular. T squared Second, one. <laughs> Second. When I, when I put given values into a function, I like to just put them in the brackets as I do that, just to make sure you get it all right and the wrong right thing is... Second part of A... Was angular acceleration. We'll call that A. Want of a better letter to call it. Okay. Is D two theta by D T squared. So we've got a differentiate. Minus twelve. Minus twelve times one equals right.
Right. Turning points. In the diagram below, the curve has two turning points at P and Q. And this is kind of relevant because if I if I throw something up in the air, vertical, and I want to work out go to and I'm displacement is I get where the peak of the curve of movement is, I can find maximum height. So we'll go through something like that. But more importantly, find and turning points. It's got two turning points, P and Q. There's P, there's Q, okay. Where the slope of the curve is zero. At the at a turning point, the slope of the curve is zero. And we know that the slope of a curve is its differential. D over dx or whatever other variables you're using. Okay? Point P is a point that is a maximum point. The slope prior to a maximum is positive. But the slope here, this one that's going up with time, it's a positive slope. And after it, there's a negative. If we look at point Q, it's minimum. The slope prior to a minimum is negative, And after, positive. Right? So, minimum point to the, to the um, point y by dx is less than zero. The y by dx is greater. can use that to help us find and determine the nature of turning points in a function. Sorry? Where? Where's that? So yeah, those two there should read minimum on that side. Sorry about that. Also possible for a function to have a turning point where the gradient on either side is the same. <coughs> so some functions above um, quadratics, some cubics and higher order polynomials can have what's called a point of inflection. And at a point of inflection, so if you find, if you, it's possible to find a turning point, i.e. a point where the gradient is equal to zero, and find that either the slope is positive before and after that type of point of inflection, or the, a second type of point of inflection is that the slope is negative both before and after. Yeah? So just because you get before and after that's the same way round doesn't mean you've gone wrong. That means you've got a point of inflection rather than a turning point where it goes from a positive slope to a negative slope or negative to positive. All right? So procedure for finding and distinguishing between turning points. First, we need to find the x and y values at the turning point. So if, we, if we're given a function, we determine dy by dx. So we differentiate. Then we let that differential equal to 0 and solve for the values of x. We substitute the values of x in the original equation to find the corresponding y-coordinate value. This establishes the x and y-coordinate 
of the turning point. It finds out where on the graph it is. X, Y. Yeah? What we then do, we've got two options to find out whether it is a minimum, a maximum, or a point of inflection. Option one, as we look at the value of the function a little bit to the left with a lot, slightly lower value of x, slightly higher value of x, and find out whether it changes from... A look, determine the sign of the gradient just before and just after. So we take our differential, put a lower value of x in, slightly higher, and whether it goes from positive to negative or vice versa, or whether it indicate positive to negative, maximum, negative to positive is a minimum, positive to positive or negative to negative within the point of view. Option two is to find the second differential, so differentiate again. Substitute in x2, this one here. And if the result is positive, it's a minimum. If negative, it's a maximum. So you've got a point of inflection. Okay? Now, it might be easier on a polynomial, but again, would you like to find the differential of that sine function we had earlier? Probably not. Not today. Okay? So I think on something like that, should a value out of the value at the turn and, and see what from pod. Alright? And we'll have a look at an example. So we're going to find the maximum and minimum values of the curve y is equal to x cubed minus 3x plus 5. Find, look on either side and find in the second potential. So the process we need to use is, first of all, if differential of that function, so differentiate x, 3x. Differentiate, yes, 3x squared, sorry, yeah. minus 3. That's the first differential. But second step, so this is step. Differentiate. Step two, let differential equal zero. So we say squared minus three, zero. What type of function is that? As a quadratic. So we've got to find the values of x that satisfy that quadratic. What method would you like to use? Quadratic, uh, quadratic equation. Yeah. So we can say x is equal to minus b plus or minus square root y c. No, b squared, b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. You want to use that? If that is, it will be in your formula sheet, and it always works. You could factorize, but you could also use that. Yeah? So we go on. Minus b, b is 
plus or minus the square root of 0 squared minus 4 times A in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c, the quadratic form. No, you should know that a quadratic standard form is i times x, ax squared bx plus c. Because B, because there's no X term in that, is there? Looking at that, there's no term with just X. So there's no X terms, so B is zero. Oh, okay. Yeah? No, we don't cut C is minus 3. Four times P is 3 times C is minus 3 all over which is 3 square root of minus this evaluate to Six. Right. Thought. So minus square root of thirty six over six. X is equal to one. X is equal to minus one. Two points. Am I right or wrong? Well, you've got to do X seven. Minus six over six is minus one. So there are two turning points. TP1, TP2. So we've got a turning point in this, in this function where x is equal to 1. And we've got a turning point where x is equal to minus 1. We've got to substitute the values in the original function to find the values of y. So let's do for TP1 A is equal to turn it here, original cubed. So, x is 1, that's our three. so y is equal to 1 squared minus 3 times 1 plus 5. No, the original function, oh yes, sorry, cubed minus 3x, so that's cubed. 1 cubed is 1, 3, minus 3 is minus 2, plus 5, y must be equal to 
3. Therefore, TP1 is at 1, 3 on that graph. Yeah. For TP2, when X is equal to minus 1, Y is equal to minus 1 cubed, minus 3 times minus 1, plus 5, equals. This, this is equal to minus 1, plus 3, is it not? Plus another 5, agree? Yeah. Yep. So TP2 is at minus 1, comma 7. So on our, if we've got a graph like this, and that's where x is plus 1, we've got a turning point where y is 3, there somewhere, and when x is minus 1, we've got a turning point where y is up here, at 7. Yeah? But we don't know their nature yet. We don't know which one's the minimum, which one's the maximum, or if there's a point of inflection. Okay? Yeah, because the question asks for it. Determine, find the minimum and maximum values. So, I'm going to just uh, go on a new slide, I think. TP1 at 1, comma, 3, won't it? Yeah. When x equals 0 0.5, dy by dx is equal to, what was the function for dy by dx? So we're talking about 3 times 0 0.5 squared. What we're doing now is looking slightly either side of that value and seeing whether the value of the slope changes from positive to negative or negative to positive, remember. We're looking to find out whether it's a minimum or a maximum. Yeah. Minus what? Equals? Minus 2.25. So the slope before x is equal to 1 is negative. Yeah? When x is equal to 1.5, dy by dx is equal to 3 times 1.5 squared minus 3 is equal to 3.75 positive. Yeah. Therefore, Negative to positive, we're talking about a slope that's going from negative to positive must be a minimum.
Yep. How are we going to do the other one, TP2? Yeah. And x is equal to minus 1.5. dy by dx is 3 times minus 1.5 squared minus 3 when x is equal to minus 0.5 bear in mind you need to choose these values carefully uh, i.e. avoid going too far away from the turning point value because it, you could go past another turning point. Yeah? So you want to be a, a, a small amount away, not too much. And the top one equals when x is minus 1.5, 3.75, i.e. is positive, and when it's minus 0.5, Ooh. negative. So we're going from Positive to negative means TP2 is a maximum. Yep. B, you, you won't get all this in the exam question. Using <laughs> well, that says you uh, use the, the use the sign of the second derivative. <laughs> Using the second derivative method. So we got dy by dx. is equal to 3x squared minus 3. Yep. D2y. Yeah, it's shorter for so if you can find the second differential. So this, this is an option for finding its our minimum and maximum by finding the slope of the second differential. Um, if you can, if you can easily find the second differential, which you can here, second differential, differentiate three x squared, differentiate minus three. Yeah. So at TP one, where x is equal to one, d two y. by dx squared is equal to 6 times 1 equals 6. That's positive. And if we look back at the summary page when the second differential is positive, we've got a minimum. So it's finding that TP1 is a minimum. Yep. Therefore, at TP2, when x is equal to minus 1, d 
d2y by dx squared is equal to 6 times minus 1 equals minus 6 negative therefore tp2 is a maximum yeah. you can um, but uh, do you have the ability to find that second derivative for some functions if you take, like, I keep going back to the one we did earlier, and, I, and that it's not particularly difficult, but messy, and then you're going to put those values into the different values to x into that function twice. You think of it that that's awkward. Either way, it's awkward, you know, but, and I mean, in actual fact, in a sine function, there's lots of turning points, aren't there? So you, yeah. So you know, you need to know exactly in what area you were looking, where you wanted to know the turn, the, like the first turning point or something, the first peak. You needed to know where that was or, or something, because you're going to get in a function that looks like that. You've got a heck of a lot of minimum and maximum. So you'd want to be focusing in on the first peak or something and, and how big it is. All right? <laughs>